All right, let's get started. So this is our last day. And I hope that everyone has enjoyed the session so far. By way of reminder, you can always revisit the lessons either using your transcript feature, which is available up here. Actually, it's in the wrong spot for me to grab because my Zoom controls are in the way. But yeah, it's up here in the, we have to click it twice if you're in a single column mode. Uh, but you can, you can get a transcript uh, right here from any range of dates. Or you can go to the, the course website and, and look at the scripts there. So it's not exactly what happened in class. It was what was prepared for class. But the advantage is you can go through it interactively. So it's less of a review and more of a you know, reliving of the class. It's got the video and everything there. So before we get started on really doing stuff today, I want you to go ahead and run this cell because we'll install some packages that we're going to need later. So I want to get things started with a little bit of review from last time. So we started talking about grammar of graphics as an approach to building data visualizations. And the idea was to avoid having to manually specify every object drawn in the figure and instead tell the system what data or what columns from the data frame we want to associate with each aesthetic element of the graph. So these are things like position, horizontal or vertical, as well as size, shape, color, et cetera. And so this association between data and aesthetic is called an aesthetic mapping. And the key idea of ggplot2 is to develop simple ways of building these aesthetic mappings so that we're not, again, having to manually create stuff on the screen. And there are various ways you can imagine going about this, but the, the design decision that was chosen in ggplot2 is to build up a graphic as a, a base object, which supplies the data, as well as further layers that can be things like geometries that specify which geometries to draw and what aesthetic mappings to use when you draw them, or further details like labels, et cetera, more cosmetic things. Okay, but we'll start with a basic ggplot2 object and then we'll add layers to it to refine the graph. And so we've been doing that so far, starting with this figure. So we said we want to create uh, this figure in ggplot2. And we kind of, we, we looked at how this figure is built and we kind of broke it down and we started creating this figure and we had sort of very basic rudimentary version. And so today what we're going to do is finish that off and, and have the actual code that generates this exact figure. But here's where we had gotten so far. Okay, so let's load our, our packages. ggplot2, dplyr, I'll run this again so we don't get those warnings. So ggplot2 and dplyr, we're gonna, well, this was the graphics package. Of course, we're gonna use that. We're also gonna use some data manipulation in a little bit. So we'll go ahead and pull in dplyr. We also wanna load in our data, of course. And so here's what we have. We're assigning to the P variable, the merge data frame piped into the ggplot function. So this is gonna create a basic ggplot object. And it's got this aesthetic mapping function call inside the ggplot argument, or, or rather in, inside the ggplot call. So that's maybe a bit strange. We introduced that at the beginning of last time. But in any case, once we add the point geometry and the text geometry, to this plot object, we get something we can actually see, and we're on our way to having the graphic that we want. But by, by way of just recalling what we discussed last time, what are we doing with this aesthetic function call inside the ggplot call rather than having it inside the two geom calls like you would normally do it? I want to share a few of the answers here. There's some very nice explanations here of what's going on. So the, the point is that if we supplied the aesthetic mappings, which associate population with the horizontal position and, and total with the vertical position, if we did that inside each geometry, we'd have to repeat that here and here. And if we had a further geometry that was going to use that same association between X and Y and these two columns from the data frame, we would have to repeat them still more times. So ggplot provides this very nice feature where you can supply an aesthetic at the level of the ggplot object. And it's a global setting. So that aesthetic mapping will apply to every subsequent geometry, even though you 
don't specify it. And that way you don't have to repeat yourself. Okay, so it's, it's making sure that you have to repeat yourself a, a minimal amount as you create these graphics. Okay, so the, the, the key point is that you, you often wanna use the same mapping in multiple geometries and this feature allows you to avoid having to say that twice. The size equals three argument here is gonna change the point size since we're supplying it to the point geometry and that's what we wanna do. And it's not inside of a, an aesthetic mapping call. There's no AES function here because it's not associating any data with the size aesthetic. It's just setting the size aesthetic for all the points regardless of the data. And similarly for nudge underscore X, we're gonna have a value of 1.5 here applying equally well to all of them. So there's no data mapping there. So there's no aesthetic function call. Now we can always uh, override the global mapping in any particular uh, geom. So you're not stuck with whatever you supplied initially in every geom if you don't want to be. So for example, if we call geom underscore text and then we supply these new values, then that's going to work uh, for creating a new text here that is not looking at the data, right? So it's, it's overriding the aesthetic mapping that was defined in the, in the object P. And so, you, you, yeah, you can see in the, in the graphic that it's not using population in total. It's just using the X and Y, y values that we specified. Uh, however, I will point out that this is not the right way to add text annotations. It sort of looks here like we, we added this little message and you could use this technique to do that. You shouldn't do that because when you're using a geom, every row of the data frame adds something to the table. Like if we added an extra row, we'd get an extra point here. Or, or sorry, I should say add something to the figure. In any case, we're going to get hello there printed on the screen however many row, uh, many times, however many rows there are in the data frame. And you can sort of see that here if you look carefully. It doesn't look like it was just printed once. It looks like it was stamped on uh, on top of itself there many times. And, and that's bad. So if you, if you want to just make a little annotation somewhere, you use the annotate function. Like for example, we have this vertical line and this is how that vaccine introduced text was added to the figure. We just manually specify where it should go and we tell it we want the text geometry as we write this text to the screen. And, and the reason that that needs to be specified is that you're gonna have annotations that are not necessarily text annotations. For example, this dark gray rectangle is an annotation on this graph that we looked at. And there you would just say annotate geom equals rect. So there are you know, a few of these different kinds of annotations and you just say which one. Yes, yeah, so there's just a, a question here I think this question came in before I said this, but yeah, so just to, to follow up, if you're explicit with other geometries, it will overwrite the default ones. Yeah, that's, that's right. Okay, so the next thing we want to tackle is the scale. We've been looking at the, uh, the original figure had a, a log scale on the X and Y axis, and, and now we're looking at a linear scale on the X and Y axis. So we want to do something about that. And if we look at the cheat sheet and poke around, we can see that there are scale options. So there are layers that we can add that involve the name scale. And there's kind of a, a naming scheme here. So scale underscore X underscore continuous is a function that you use to add a layer, which says how you want to change the horizontal scaling. So that's X and, and specifically when the horizontal axis is continuous rather than discrete. So we'll use the log 10 transformation uh, to do that here. And we'll see what that looks like. And sure enough, the points are much more nicely spread out now. So this was the point of doing the log scaling. We've got a lot more space. We can see details in the figure a lot better now, both vertically and horizontally. That was a, a good improvement. And notice that we also changed the nudge value. That's just because we're, we're changing the scale. So the, the original nudge value doesn't work anymore. So that's something you just kind of have to play with and see. Uh, it's a nice thing about the interactive nature of this workflow. You can you can make these edits and see how things update uh, and kind of put yourself into the loop of making a really nice looking figure. You know, it's not, it's not something we can do to sort of verbally specify 
in some abstract sense what you want the figure to be and then have the system render something beautiful. We do have a little bit of, of discretion where, where we need to use some judgment about the way things should look. There is an abbreviation here to do this more simply because it comes up a lot. So instead of having to supply the, the trans, uh, transformation argument to the scale x continuous function, you can just do scale x log 10 and that's equivalent. So we're gonna get exactly the same figure here as we did just a second ago, but this is a little more concise. A couple of questions came in. Yeah, so the first one is, yeah, what if we just transform the data ourselves? So, so you can do that, but it's not gonna be the same because you can see here that the, the labels on the graph are in the original units. And that's gonna be less confusing for most users. So, the, so scaling the axes instead has the advantage that the, the labels refer to the original data rather than the transformed data. And that, that's super useful because you, you don't want people to have to see a one, a two, and a three here and then have to remember that they need to, to apply that as an exponent on 10. You know, if you're, especially if you think about like producing figures for a, a news publication or something, getting people to exponentiate numbers is definitely not the business you want to be in. You want to make things as simple as possible. Uh, and similarly here, you see it's one, three, 10, 30, these equally spaced lines and, or actually they're not quite equally spaced, but pretty close. Uh, that, that really only works because uh, the axis itself has been scaled rather than the uh, data. But yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, and that, okay, actually the other question that was up was, uh, was the same question. Okay, here's Bruno. If you didn't see him on day eight, say, hey Bruno. Hey. Okay, he's gonna go meet my my wife's students. Hi, Bruno. No. Oh. He's a he's a hot commodity. So yeah, so we're talking about labels and titles here. So these are just simple things to add on. You you get a free label from your data frame, or from how you define the column when you're creating the aesthetic mapping. So we saw the divided by 10 to the six, then that actually prints on the horizontal axis. If we look back up here, so population divided by 10 to the six. So there's, that's very nice for quick and dirty stuff. But when you prepare a figure four public publication, you often wanna be much more careful about how you specify things like X and Y labels. So we have the X lab function and Y lab function, which allow us to add a layer, which directly specifies what that text should be. So that's gonna override the default text. And we also have GG title, uh, same idea. And this is this GG here is to avoid conflicting with the base function. But yes, yeah, so we have a title there now and we have X labels and Y labels. So that, that are supplying more detail. So that's looking good. So that's very simple. There's not really a lot to learn there, just the function names. So we do have some more things to do though. So the, this figure is not colorful and the, the one that we're targeting is colorful. So we've, the, and, and in fact, the colors are not just there for looks, they add some information. So we need to get that built up. Let's go ahead and assign all of this stuff that we've done so far to the variable P. So we're overriding P. And that way we can just add new stuff to it and not keep printing this over and over again as we go. When you're working for real, you don't have to worry about that so much, but when you're explaining these things and each one comes out one at a time, you've got to, uh, kind of co collect what you've done so far at, at some point to avoid repeating yourself a lot. Yeah, let's just make the points blue and see how that works. So if we just supply the color argument to the point geom, then all the points turn blue exactly as you would guess. But there's no meaning there. This just changes how the, the figure looks. If we want to encode data, we need to make an aesthetic mapping. So if we, if we assign a categorical variable to uh, the color argument, it automatically assigns a different color to each category and adds a, a legend. So this is stuff you, you might imagine you would need to handle manually, but if you think about it, it makes sense. Anytime you say, okay, I want you to look at this categorical column for this color, what else would you really want to do other than assign colors to each of the categories and then put a legend on the figure so that someone can see the correspondence between categories and colors. So 
that's what ggplot does by default. And uh, this is what it looks like. So it's, I think exactly what you would guess, we're now associating data with an aesthetic. So we need to put an aesthetic function call there. And otherwise it's gonna look the same. So that's terrific. We get this legend here. Notice that it, it kind of scrunches the figure up for us in order to make space for this legend. And then we get points here of appropriate color. So we see that, you know, the states in the south are green and the states in the west are, are purple and so on. So this is really all we had to do. Just say, hey, for color, look at this column in the data frame. That's it. All the rest of it's automatic. So you, you can turn the legend off if you have some reason to. So just show.legend equals false in the geom point call, and that'll take the legend out of it. But we want, we're going to want the legend there. Yes, yeah, so this is an important point. When, when it comes to color palettes, so this is, a, this is a common point of discussion when you talk about data visualization. So it's, it's generally considered wise to use a, a color palette created by someone, uh, cre created by an expert who can take into account things like contrast between the different colors and color blindness. So this is the default one in ggplot2. And although I can't say definitively, I feel sure that it's made with colorblindness sensitivity because the people who decide these things really care a lot about that. Yeah, so you want to use either the default color palette or, um, so as we'll see, you can change uh, what's called themes and, um, and get the default color palette for that new theme. So you don't probably want to be manually doctoring the colors unless you have a really good reason to. Um, but you, you, there are ways to change the color palette, and there are ways to change the theme. And we'll see, we'll see some of that in a bit. Because you'll notice this is not, this doesn't look the same as the figure that we're targeting yet in, in terms of overall style. There's, you know, this background is is gray. That's the ggplot default. But the one that we're targeting, which I'm realizing now, I should have pinned. Um, it's blue. I mean, is it too late to go back up all the way up and, and find it and pin it? Yeah, there it is. So we can pin it and we can even shrink it a little bit so it gets less in the way. But in any case, the point is uh, the, the, these don't look the same yet. We're going to have to do some more changing. The legend is also across the top instead of the side. We're going to get those kind of changes for free from, from switching themes. The colors are the same though. So this particular theme doesn't change the, the colors of the points. So let's add that dashed line. So this is helpful, I think, to see how not everything is specified through th this kind of rigid framework where we're associating geoms with data in the data frame. This is going to be kind of an extra add-on thing that we're going to put in. So this is the, the dashed line that you see here. That's what we're going to work on. So we, we need to, first of all, determine the overall rate, and we're going to call that R, so the overall murder rate average across the, the entire country. And then the line is going to just be Y times Rx. So when you, when you know your population, you multiply it by the appropriate rate, and that gives you the number of murders you would have if your rate were exactly equal to the national average. And because we're looking on a log scale here, we need to take the log and we see that log of y equals log of r plus log of x. So once we work out what r is, we just need to plot the line, you know, um, log y equals log r plus log x. So let's see how that works. So the first thing we need to do is actually extract the value, the average rate. And so let's just ask quickly for some ideas on that. So how how can we calculate the value of R? Yeah, so, so several folks ha have the right idea mathematically. The question is, what's, what's a clean way to do it in R? So there are a couple of different approaches. So one we're seeing here is to use the dollar sign. So we, let's, let's do this together. So we'll pull out the murders data, uh, data set here. So we want to get the total population. We want to sum up what happens in this particular row and, or sorry, in this particular column. And we also want to sum up 
what happens in this last column. So really just trying to sum two columns here. So we can just do that murders population and, and sum it and murders total and sum that. And that gives us a, an overall rate. And then we need to, um, sorry, I did it again. So I used the total being in the denominator, do that reflexively. And then we need to, to do it per million. So that's an extra factor of 10 to the sixth. So it's 30.34. That we can also do it with dplyr by by piping the murder state of frame into the summarize function. So same idea. We can say what the total is, or, or rather, let's call it rate, and, and do sum of murders divided by sum of population. 10 to the 6. In this particular case, I don't think the dplyr approach is really uh, any better. I think it's pr pretty well equivalent. Oops. I'm realizing that I, ne I need to make sure that this text field goes over the top of the pinned message. That's not a problem that's come up before. All right, I did something silly. In any case, I, <laughs> I, have, I have a solution here. It looks the same to me, so I guess I just mistyped something. Yes, yeah, so anyway, this is what it looks like in the book. This is the book solution. Yes, yeah, so we get the same value. The key idea there is that the summarize function is the one that allows you to collapse columns down in, into single numbers. But anyway, as I said, this is more concise without using the dplyr approach. So it's all good, whatever you do. All right. And then we want to actually add the line. And the, the geom for that is called geom underscore ab line. So you would think that it might be geom underscore line, and you could do it that way. but in order to do that, you'd have to create a kind of custom data frame that just has your, your A and B value, your intercept and your slope value, sort of artificially jammed into a data frame. And, and so we have this convenience function, AB line, that, that take the slope and intercept as arguments. So yeah, so we're going to say that the intercept is log 10 of R. That's what we decided a second ago when we were, were translating the Y equals MX plus B formula into... We're taking the log of that uh, with a B value of zero, and we're going to get the right thing. The reason we don't have to specify slope here is that the slope's va default value is one. So we could say that slope equals one, but it's the default. So just keep it more concise and leave it out. And and we get this line, which is what we were going for. It looks it looks steeper than it ought to be, but that's just because the the aspect ratio of the figure here here it's you know pretty wide compared to how tall it is, and, and here. The opposite is true. Okay, so notice that we added an object that doesn't use any information from the data frame. That's totally fine if you if you have other values supplied that are enough for the geom to do what it needs to do. Then of course it doesn't have to look at the data frame, and and that's not a problem. So the this line is still pretty ugly. For one thing, it's over the top of the data. You definitely don't want that. And it's also in the figure, it's dashed in gray, which which is nicer looking. So let's make that happen. Here's, here's how that works. So we're going to supply more arguments. These, again, are not aesthetic mappings. They're just options to supply to the geom. So the color is going to be dark gray. That's the appropriate color for that dash line. And the line type is going to be two. So you just have to look this up. There's not a, a clean way to, to do this better. The line type of two is this dash line. You just have to look at the documentation for geom AB line. Yeah, so that looks much better. We have the start dash line now, and it's where we want it to be. Oh yeah, good question. I did forget to mention this. How does it go from being over to being under? Yeah, notice we, we drew the line first, added that layer first. Right, so great question. Yeah, that's important. So the layers get added. If, if you add a layer which draws something to the canvas, it will, that those drawing operations happen in the order of the layers. So you want something to go behind something else, you, you just add the layer corresponding to that thing first. And there was one other question here. Yeah, so that LTY equals two, that, that's the, the, the dashed option. Yeah, so we, we can start to see here a little bit how a, a graphical user interface does have some advantages. Like you could imagine being able to sort of right click on the line and select dashed instead of having to know that you say LTY equals two inside the geom AB line call. The, these kinds of things can 
especially in your first learning, making these kinds of tweaks can take some time to figure out the right setting. The cheat sheet is very useful, but it's not comprehensive because there really are a ton of these things ultimately. So you've got to make do with the documentation, which fortunately is very good. But you, basically, you either know it off the top of your head, or you can find it on the cheat sheet, or you need to check down and look at the documentation. But between those three things, you can you can get done what you need to, to do. And as you use it more, the operations will be more kind of at, at the top of mind. You'll at least know where to find them more quickly and easily. And you'll remember some things off the top of your head. So for example, if we want to change, notice here, this is region with a lowercase. That comes from the data frame, but you might want to capitalize it. That's the way it's done here in, in the thing that we're targeting. You know, you, you need to have an idea what layer to add. And, and the correct answer is scale, color, discrete. And you can supply a name argument there and, and just change it to be whatever you want. So let's go ahead and do that. And also go ahead and update P based on that. So now the region label here is capitalized. So again, this is something you just have to look at the cheat sheet or, or the documentation to try to find the right way to control these things. It is something that takes a lot of time when you're, when you're first using this stuff for real in the wild, you'll, you'll learn a lot of basic things in a class that are important and help you get kind of most of your figure done, but then there's always gonna be that last 10% of adjustments you wanna make that you're gonna to have to be looking things up and, and it takes some time. Okay, so ggplot2, the, the core package has been stable for quite a long time. It's been around for a long time. There's an enormous amount of code written that's designed to work with it. And so they don't wanna be continually making big changes to ggplot2. However, there are things that you might wanna do that haven't been built yet and improvements are always welcome. And the way that that's designed is that there are packages for the ggplot2 package. So it's sort of a second order package, if you will packages which are explicitly designed to add functionality to ggplot2. They often start with gg to help keep that straight. And we're gonna use a couple called gg themes and gg repel. And those we've already installed back at the, at the very beginning. So if you didn't do that, you, you wanna do that now. Maybe I'll quickly put that back in for people who showed up late. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so yeah, the, let's start with gg themes. So we can change the theme by using the gg themes package. And fortunately, we can already do that here without getting into the weeds because our DS Labs package has a function called DS theme set, which is going to set the theme to be what we want for the, the figures that are in this book that we're relying on. You can add lots of other themes in, instead. Like, for example, you can add theme underscore economist, and your figures will look like the figures that appear in the, the economist. So let's see what happens when we add that theme to the plot that we have already. We see that things change in a way that makes it look more similar to this. So the horizontal lines are now white and the background is this uh, bluish gray color instead of being a plain gray. Um, it's not exactly the same as this one, but it, it, it's more similar. Another one is 538. So they've packaged their stuff and you can try that out. Uh, let's just type it here. Yeah, so that, looks so uh, the legend is at the bottom it looks fairly similar overall we have a dark gray we have dark gray grid lines you get the idea all right some of the 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 looks uh the kind of overall looks of the figure change but the essential content of it stays the same okay so here's one more difference this is the last thing that we'll do before we'll have this exact figure done if we look at the, the way the labels are done here, they're way smarter and better. If you, if you look at this figure, all the labels are just to the right, which means some of them are kind of hard to read because they run into another point or run into another label. And that kind of stinks. Here things are, are cleverly spaced out to kind of always dodge other things as much as possible. And we even have lines coming in when it's not possible to put it kind of just at the right spot, we have a little line that's telling us where we need to look. So that's really great. And you would think that's a ton of, of work that you're gonna have to do to get all those positions just right. It's not, it's not an easy computational problem for, for a human to solve. So what we are gonna do is use a package called GG Repel, which actually does all of this automatically, which is really, I think, brilliant. 
you know, it has to be aware of where the, the points all are, point sizes, and where the other labels are. It's a, it's a very complex computational problem. And yet, all we have to do to leverage all of that work that's gone into this package is to switch geom text with geom text repel. So it's a new geometry, behaves like the other one, but again, it, it's smarter about how it positions the labels. So all we have to do is, is just put an extra underscore repel in our geom text call, and that's going to do it. So I'm just going to put, put it all out there. So this is, we're pulling P back out of it, and now we've got everything all in one place so that you can see exactly what's happening. And this is our figure. So, okay, it's not, it's not actually not exactly the same as this one. I guess I pulled this one from a different place in the book where they had done it with a, there was a little shorter, because you can see it's got to use a lot more of these lines. Yeah, so anyway, so th this is this is our complete figure though. It looks pretty sharp, I think. It looks like something that would be totally at home in a, in a legit, you know, uh, high profile publication. And yet we just wrote this fairly modest amount of code to generate it. And everything that we're doing here, once you understand the scheme, it's, it's fairly transparent. There are a few things like LTY equals two that are a little bit, you know, not, not something you would recognize unless you really know what you're looking at. But by and large, this is, this is fairly comprehensible and the, the pieces can be kind of pulled apart and recombined to produce lots of different interesting graphs without having to, you know, do a, do a lot of, um, a, a lot of hard work for each one. Okay. So yeah, so we have a lot of pieces here. It's, it's far from all of them, but uh, there are many important ggplot2 concepts illustrated in this example. So data, obviously, geometries and aesthetics, those are the core pieces. Layers are how we, we produce that aesthetic mapping and add other content to the figure. Things like scales are added in layers and, and themes as well. What we did not really get into here is the idea of stats, which are statistical transformations of the data. So things that you might want to do to the data before plotting it. Like instead of a line plot that goes through every single point in your data frame, you might want to smooth it out a little bit. Okay, so there's a geom underscore smooth that will do that for you. And that that is embedding a statistical transformation. So that, that's a whole side of ggplot2 that we haven't explored. And, and then also faceting, which we're going to talk about here in a minute. We're not going to be able to get through this next example. So I'm just going to start it and we'll get as far as we get. But uh, this is a, a really helpful aspect of ggplot2. It can be quite sophisticated to, to make a figure that has many subplots fitting together. And faceting allows you to do that in a very convenient way that covers a, a lot of use cases. Um, incidentally, if you just want to put two figures side by side, though, not necessarily in a, a smart way, but just make one figure, make another figure, and put them side by side, there's something called grid extra that allows you to do that. So if we install the grid extra package, we can make a couple of quick plots. So qplot is a function in ggplot that is basically like the regular plot function in base R, except it will make your plots in the ggplot style. So you don't have this kind of discontinuity where you're switching from base R to ggplot. And yet you don't have to, like if you just want to do a quick plot with a couple of variables, you don't want to have to, to necessarily create a ggplot object, add layers, think about aesthetic mappings, all that stuff. Sometimes you just want to say, okay, I've got a couple of vectors here, let's throw them up on the screen. And qplot allows you to do a quick plot for that. But in any case, grid.arrange, which comes from this grid extra package, allows you to just put figures side by side. We're like, hey, we want two columns for these two figures. And there we go, we get them, looks like this. Okay, so we're gonna do another example, but in the meantime, I'll just ask if folks have any questions, just to kind of create a pause here. So here's one, could, it, could points of different shapes uh, corresponding to the region? Uh, yes, we can do that. So that's just the shape aesthetic. And it's handled just like the color aesthetic. If you assign it to, uh, if you map a categorical variable to the shape aesthetic, you'll automatically get a collection of shapes and it will map each category to each shape. And maybe we can look at what that looks like up here by just ch changing call equals region, shape equals region. Let's see what that does.
I actually think it's quite a nice idea to use to associate both shape and yeah. So we'll, we'll need the legend to be, and we can we can turn off the the legend here. Yeah, so turning the legend off is not an aesthetic mapping, so I shouldn't have put it in the AES call. Okay, yeah, so you, you can see we have like squares for the for the blue color here and circles for the the uh, orange color, whatever that is. Um, so yeah, I, I think this is actually kind of a nice idea because it gives you two forms of contrast. So you're, you're representing the same piece of data in two different aesthetics at the same time, which just creates more kind of more visual contrast. But the, the legend here, is pretty messed up. So you, you'd have to tinker with that a little bit to, to fix that appropriately. Yeah, so let's take a look at another one of the figures that we saw briefly. So yeah, let's just look at this, this uh, kind of backstory. I think it's very helpful when you're looking at a data set to, to get some of the narrative around where the data came from, what the motivations were, because it can really help you contextualize things that you find. And so, so for this particular Gapminder data set, uh, this comes from the Gapminder Foundation. And the idea was to put out some, some, some very concrete kind of high level data, canonical sort of forms of data that can be used to, to look at narratives about distinctions between, you know, what, what might be called the developed world and the developing world. And think about how those those narratives maybe don't change over time as fast as the data does. So we'll want to update our beliefs to be consistent with the way the world actually is, rather than sort of holding on to ideas that were maybe forged in, in a time when things were different. So that that's the idea. There, here's a link to a couple of talks to kind of provide more context uh, for this data set if you're interested. But the the answers, the, sorry, the questions that we'll try to answer are, is it, a, is it a fair characterization to say that the world is roughly divided into Western rich nations in largely in, in America, North America and uh, Western Europe and developing world nations in Africa, Asia and Latin America. And also uh, separately has income inequality worsened or, or gotten better in the last 40 years. So these are both questions we'll, we can look at with the data. We're only gonna start looking at the first one here on account of time, but you can continue in the book for further discussion at this point. So we can, we can access the data first of all. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So we'll pull in the Gapminder data, uh, data set, which comes in as a data frame. So we convert that to a tibble using the as tibble function. And then I wanna select so I'll take this off for a second. In this particular interface, oh, it actually works. I've got this window nice and wide. So I guess this is fine just like that. It is worth noting though, that if you wanna select columns using the select function based on their index, so let's say I just want the first seven columns, you can do that. So it doesn't have to be names here. It can also be numbers. So the select function is smart about that. In any case, this is what our data set looks like. So we have a country and a year and then for each of those combinations, we're gonna have all of these pieces of data about mortality, life expectancy, fertility, population, gross domestic product, and then some regional information, what continent it's on and what region within that continent. So this is quite a bit of data. We have 10,000 rows here. It's so many because we have lots of countries and then also lots of years. So if we wanna look at the years, what we can do is um, select the year column and then, and then pipe that into the unique function. And we'll see we have 1960 up through 2016. Okay, so let, let's start looking at this question. So we wanna investigate the idea that we have Western world countries and developing world countries, and that these are characterized by longer versus shorter lifespans and smaller versus larger families, respectively. So the, these data to, to answer these questions about birth rates and uh, life expectancies in various countries, we, we have all the data here. We need to investigate this question and think about the extent to which it's true. And data visualization is a, is a great way to investigate that. So you're gonna get richer detail out of the figure than you will out of any sort of summary analysis that's gonna produce 
you know, a, a single number or a few numbers trying to characterize these things. Okay, so let's let's start by making a, a scatter plot of life expectancy versus fertility rate. So we'll we'll start by looking specifically early on in the data set, let's say at 1962. So here's what this looks like. So we can filter the Gapminder data set on the condition that the year is 1962. So that throws away most of the rows. We'll still have one row per country. And then we can look at the relationship between fertility and uh, life expectancy with a scatter plot. So we'll use the point geom. And it looks like this. So we can, we can kind of summarize this by saying, you have this one, your, your eye, uh, I think, kind of picks up on two clusters here. One is this one up high where you have high life expectancy and, and mostly low fertility rate. And then this other group down here where you have very high, uh, very high birth rate, but, but quite low life expectancy compared to these uh, up here. And well, of course, you really want to know what regions these points correspond to, because as it is, it's just telling you the relationship with these two particular variables, not how those variables might intersect with ge uh, geography. So, so what should we do? So what, what, what do you want to do to include geography? What would be a good idea? Yeah, exactly. So this is a great job. We just want to associate the color aesthetic with the columns telling us something about region in the data frame. Actually, there are many regions because each continent is broken into to multiple regions. So just at the first level to make sure we don't have too many categories, let's just look at continent. Yeah, we're sort of we're a little bit stuck between that's a uh, that's a good point, Tom. Um, there's sort of too many regions and not enough continents. Uh, but anyway, we can just look at continent and that'll give us some ideas of what's going on. So all we're going to do is say color equals continent in this aesthetic mapping call here and, and the rest of it's the same. So this is a very nice thing about ggplot2. We can make very modest changes which are directly communicating our intent that nevertheless do exactly what we want to, to change the figure and make it easier to look at. So yeah, so if we look at this, this figure, see if I can zoom in on the, the scatter plot, then we see that sure enough, the African countries are largely clustered down here. And there are some countries in the Americas that are up here. And Europe is, is very much across the top of this figure. So th this kind of makes sense. It's 1962, this is when the, the kind of dichotomy of the West versus developing world would, would have kind of taken root. And it, we indeed see that in the data. So that, that makes some amount of sense. But let's, let's look 50 years later and, and see what's going on. Um, what, what we'd like to do really, instead of just changing the year, which we could do, is put another figure to the side of it. So if we, it would be nice to have the two years kind of side by side so we can directly kind of look across at the two and, and compare things. So what, what we're going to do is add a layer called a, a facet specifically a, a grid facet, which allows us to um, split up the, the graph into a bunch of smaller graphs, which are aligned into a grid. So the way that works is you say what variables you want along the horizontal and vertical facet axes, and it will split them up for you. So here's what it looks like if we do a, a grid facet on continent and year. So we'll have continent here, uh, along the, the sort of vertical facet axis and year along the horizontal one. And we can see a lot of stuff. We can see how, how things have changed. For example, these Asian countries that had lower life expectancy and higher fertility rates, they've shifted very sharply to the top left corner of this figure. Similarly, in the Americas, it was more spread out, and they're also pretty clumped near the top. Africa has also shifted a lot. Life expectancy has gone way up. Fertility rates have gone down by and large, but not as much as you've seen in, in America and Asia, and, and, and so on. You, you can look at this graph and see a lot of things that are kind of very nicely laid out by the, the, facet, uh, the faceting action that we did here. 
And really all we had to do was just add this one extra layer, which again is, is directly communicating our intent and, and not really having to put a bunch of extra manual work into how we want things laid out. We get these labels automatically added for us and, and all of that stuff. Uh, so yeah, that brings us, uh, that brings us to time. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave it here. Uh, you can pick up from there in the book. But uh, th thanks very much for your participation. And um, as I said at the beginning, I, I hope that you've really enjoyed it and, and have a great semester start starting here in a couple days.